be able to listen to your presentation. Uh, you're a, um, a professor emeritus in psychology at the Psychiatry Perlman School of Medicine uh, in Pennsylvania. I, I, something I often do, which I'm ashamed of, is looking at people's age indexes. Uh, and I can see that your age index is higher than mine. Uh, so I'm, I'm very much um, impressed. And you I don't put too much stock in those. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not me. I know how people get them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you also done a uh, TED talk, uh, at least one that I. I uh, it, that was that was it was brutal because the audience didn't speak English. They didn't understand my jokes and the prompter failed. So mm -hmm. I, I don't want to count that. OK, I think I need to do that one again. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, then I am happy to give the floor to you. Okay. Thank you. Yo, Stockholm, Stockholm University. Uh, greetings from Philadelphia. I know a lot of the world is mourning the uh, death of the uh, queen and the accession king today. Here in Philadelphia, we're mourning the death of PNN. He's a famous rapper who was assassinated the other night in, uh, in Los Angeles, but he's, he's from... Uh, uh, G Town, um, Germantown, and I used to go down there a lot to listen to music. And uh, we're mourning the uh, the death of a community leader who was shot by a 14 year old uh, uh, gangbanger. And I mourn both that the community leader and the 14 year old whose life is ruined by involvement in the American failed war on drugs. And with that in mind, um, I'd like to give special thanks. Oh, first I should say about why I think it's special that you allowed me to speak today and what I expect to learn from you. Um, I've had a lot of uh, experience uh, dealing with uh, clinical trials, but not in the same way that you have. I think I've only uh, written one treatment manual. It was for a, uh, it was not even, it was a problem solving treatment for adherence uh, to HIV medication. And then I helped uh, write some of the materials for the, um, uh, the, uh, the first clinical trial of uh, try, trying to prevent suicide, uh, the, the prospect. And, uh, and then I had some involvement in the uh, Enrich D. Uh, but I, I think uh, my engagement uh, with uh, <coughs> clinical trials is that I've I, uh, been uh, very much at war at times with, uh, uh, with the Cochrane collaboration, and they gave me the honor of a uh, uh, troublemaker uh, prize. They don't often give out, uh, and named it, uh, there's the Bill Silverman Award, who was terribly obnoxious in the beginning of Cochrane and insisted that they uh, have some standards. Um, I, I, my reference group is the International Network for the history of neuropsychopharmacology, INHN. It's quite a, uh, a, a mouthful. And um, although I'm probably a generation older than most of the people in the audience, um, I'm, a, a, I'm a generation less old, younger than, the, uh, than some of the leadership in the group uh, who are uh, sadly dying off rather rapidly. Uh, one of our uh, members that I, I first got engaged with was Don Klein, who was a tremendous influence on the development of psychotherapy and drug trials. Uh, he was a harsh critic of the National Collaborative Study. And then when, uh, uh, based on some of his ideas about uh, how uh, therapy should address strengths, not deficits, um, uh, uh, Neil Jacobson developed a behavior activation trial, and he was a harsh critic of that, uh, especially uh, the psychopharmacology arm. And uh, our group is very skeptical about psychedelics. They were on the scene when they first appeared. I should point out that the, this network of uh, uh, basically the forerunners of biological psychiatry. And in their day, the, the uh, uh, marketing budgets for psychopharmacological uh, companies of uh, pharma were le much less than the research development. And they felt that was sort of a golden era. And then came the corruption when there was more money available for marketing 
and there was uh, uh, some really dodgy development of uh, uh, psychotropic drugs, and that they, they consider that the, the the dark ages, and that was the area of corruption. And I'm going to argue that psychedelics will reach a new level of corruption, not so much in the uh, sense of money, although that's certainly at play, but in terms of basic institutions being corrupted. The FDA, the drug approval process, psychotherapy research, and it's, it's a real mess. I don't think that, uh, that psychedelics are gonna replace mental health treatment, but the message to your group is that all you're doing is really irrelevant right now because you'll never close the gap between the treatments of depression and the uh, number of depressed people in the community. And it only take a, a wild new development like psychedelics. And um, my group has been there, done that, and we're, they're not very impressed. And uh, one of the statements they gave me uh, in the conversations the other morning was the therapy development in the psychedelic trials has not come close to parallel in the stages of drug development and evaluation. Has Don Klein always felt it's not the same when you add psychotherapy to an antidepressant as when you say you add a benzodiazepine um, to uh, antidepressant. The dosage, the uh, composition uh, is not the same. And there's a, a strong element of placebo. That's what we'll be talking about. Uh, this is a joke disclosure. So, uh, uh, in the... Uh, <laughs> Where I speak, there's an obsession about disclosing your conflicts of interest. And um, that was largely stimulated by David Healy, who uh, I was able to show had, was one of the most conflicted uh, psychiatrists in the United Kingdom uh, in his heyday. And uh, I've got doxed a lot about uh, my relationship with my father. And uh, so here's something from, I believe it probably comes from 19... 86, because it said I was a consulting editor for the journal Abnormal. And basically, I was visiting uh, Boston, and uh, the uh, cockroach war was about ready to break out, in which there was an effort by a lot of the minor mob figures to keep drugs out of Chelsea and Revere, because that would bring uh, stew pigeons. And, uh, and they, they, my father, there was an attempt on his life a few weeks after this. But I was just up there and he said, people were saying he was a meathead and I hadn't seen him in a long time. So he, he did a little press conference in front of his house, this blurb. And I you know, personally don't think personal stuff should be out there like that. But later on, a lot was made of this when um, I uh, <coughs> uh, complained about the uh, clinical trial network the cancer, uh, National Cancer Institute had, and I was doxxed and that much was made of my mob connections. So um, I also like to explain my previous relationship with David Nutt. Um, I wrote uh, a short correspondence, I think it was in Lancet or Lancet Psychiatry, in which I explained that uh, cannabis in the England uh, was not the cannabis elsewhere. Because of drug prohibition, it was much more concentrated and indeed it might stimulate psychosis, but the kind of uh, cannabis that I had grown up with actually controlled, uh, it was very mild and it controlled early psychotic symptoms and delayed the onset of psychosis. And so uh, David Nutt knows I had written this. He was my hero. I, I, he was drug czar at the time, I think. And he had advocated that psilocybin was safer than alcohol and no one had ever uh, overdosed on psilocybin, which is true. And so he invited me to speak at the Imperial College, uh, but I, my schedule didn't fit. And so I was going to go back to the United States and come and had said scheduled again. Uh, but in the meantime, he had read my article about David Healy and he had uh, uh, the, the motto, uh, the uh, motto of David Healy, I believe was titled, and he had filed an ethics complaint and David Healy got a little bit psychotic for a while and uh, filed a Freedom of Information Act request for all of David Nutt's emails and all of the emails of Simon Wesley. And so I wasn't allowed to communicate with David anymore 
and then his interest died. Uh, but uh, there was a, a brief contact, and uh, I had a great deal of respect. I think he changed. I didn't. And that's when he became an advocate uh, for what should have been decriminalization for medicalization. Um, some dog shit in my life, and this is actually quite significant. Uh, so um, Americans are dealing with all the events of January uh, last year. And uh, on the eve of the inauguration of uh, President Biden, I had tweeted one tweet that whoever he picked to head SAMHSA, the uh, substance abuse and alcohol uh, controlled them all the money for them, should be someone with uh, uh, a, a PhD or an MD and a commitment to evidence-based practice. And a drunk and stoned woman uh, was offended by that. And uh, she ruminated and, and uh, surfed me all night and came in contact with Peter Kinderman and uh, Lucy Johnston and they savagely uh, cyber mobbed me uh, for, uh, for a long time. And, and so more recently, um, <clears throat> it was renewed and a uh, administrator at that university started dos dosing me and attacking me. But lo and behold, shit appeared. That, that picture you see is shit in the um, uh, dog feces in the intake valve of my 2003 Celica. And that's physical evidence. So the police had to link the physical evidence to the events uh, of the cyber mobbing. And they established that it was beyond them to figure that out. And they referred the matter to the FBI. And so I, I think we're now at a historic uh, occasion. We may see an end to cyber mobbing and an end to people in a sensor what you say based on what you didn't say somewhere else. And I think personally, it's gonna get very, uh, I think David Healy has already lost his uh, usefulness to Scientologists, I've got good word on that. And I think that people who were associated with uh, Madden America and uh, with those kinds of people are, are going to be uh, having some problems. So, um, Okay, let's talk about the hype. So I'm gonna start off with some slides based on my last talk in Greece before we get into the current talk. And uh, this is a nice slide that someone else prepared suggesting that all treatments go through a hype cycle. And right now we're at the peak of inflated expectations and there will soon be in the trough of disillusionment. And uh, you can see it all around, this is from the, uh, New York Times that uh, it, uh, these all these dramatic pictures that MDA MDMA um, uh, saving a marriage ecstasy saving a marriage and that uh, uh, I think this one's probably psilocybin it's a balm for the uh, 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 psyche uh, by war and this is a really scary one this one just came up the other day and Michael um, Feinberg one of the members of the INHN called to my attention is that they're now promoting ketamine for depression. And it, it, the article in the Washington Post showed that a woman had been administering ketamine for depression and she was all worn out at the end of the day. So her colleagues gave her some so she could go home uh, peaceful. And uh, I think ketamine is an extremely dangerous drug. It's not a um, psychedelic, it's a dissociative. And I was lucky, my only encounter with ketamine was at. Uh, Woodstock, and in the uh, the bug the drug bothering uh, that was going on as things fell apart there. I got a five ketamine and I put it in my shirt pocket, and I fell asleep in the rain. And luckily, um, they got all wet and I couldn't use them. Although you can actually absorb ketamine through the skin, and so I, I woke up and I had to deal with a woman who was on ketamine and had been walking across broken glass and was uh, 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 talking nonsense and I had to get her in some place. And then she beat the hell out of me because uh, we, we didn't have anesthetic and uh, I had to sit on her while the, the doctors pulled the glass out of her, uh, her foot and, and she worked in, me into some kind of delusion. It was definitely bad. I'd never go near ketamine again. Um, but, um, and 
I, I, and the other thing about ketamine is that a lot of the delivery systems now are injection. And a lot of us who've experimented with drugs over the years, that was always the taboo. You'd never injected stuff. And ketamine is now injected. And it's, it's very cheap um, on the street. And it's a, it's a date rape drug, uh, much worse than uh, anything else because uh, people can't remember when they're on it. Um, and um, I think there's gonna be a huge black market for it, uh, people doing it uh, at home. And Sorry for, without... uh, for interrupting. We have a question from the audience, uh, yeah. which is, uh, uh, would you like to expand on why you think ketamine is an extremely dangerous drug? I think it's important to distinguish between clinical and rec recreational use. Ah, uh, so um, see, I, I believe that uh, that drugs can be dangerous, but prohibiting them uh, is is a failed policy. And what it'll do is it'll generate a black market. So uh, ketamine, like a lot of drugs, cannot be patented. And so they uh, have to develop an expensive delivery system. And so they'll do that. Um, but the there isn't enough people who meet criteria for psychiatric disorders that are willing to take uh, things like ketamine or even psilocybin. And so they'll end up um, keeping it medicalized but uh, having it through expensive clinics. I'll talk a little bit about that. And, um, and so um, I think that if they, if ketamine got approved, it would generate immediate black market in Philadelphia for things that looked like ketamine uh, and weren't. And it also uh, uh, generated a whole needle culture. And that's what uh, parts of Philadelphia are dying from right now. And see if I, yeah, so the basically, they're stuck with mushrooms and other psychedelics can't be patented and they're too cheap to make. So what they do is they've got to develop a whole lot of hocus pocus around it uh, to make it worthwhile. And uh, so let's see, I'll jump ahead. Here is the, the capitalization right now and there are billions at stake. And uh, these drugs, uh, they, they don't want to legalize them. They want to keep them under medical control. And in the same way that they messed up uh, cannabis in the United States and in Canada, it's the same people involved messing up drugs. And um, so I'll have, I'll have more to say to that. But the, um, so we talk a lot about conflict of interest and need to disclose that. Uh, the conflict of interest in a lot of these trials is that um, they're trying to promote a product to people who don't need it. That is, they're gonna get all of these psychiatrists involved in prescribing these drugs in settings that people go to to get the drug experience, not to get mental health treatment. And there aren't enough psychiatrists to do that. There's a shortage of psychiatrists. So they're gonna drag in psychologists who are gonna make it worse. And I'll, I'll, I'll say more about that in a bit. So, the, um, so here's the, the black market scene and Kensington is a war zone. They actually had to close the train station because the toilets uh, were overflowing from all the needles and uh, 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 fentanyl, uh, bags of fentanyl that, uh, that were flushed when the police came. And so the, the, the sewage was going all over the place and there were bodies piling up. And it's really a terrible, terrible place. And uh, it used to be an okay place. And right now um, there are 80 blocks in the neighborhood and the blocks are for sale to dealers. And uh, they, they, the, the gangbangers will defend uh, the block, the owner of the block from uh, rivals. And um, I think the situation is only gonna get worse. There are countries like uh, St. Vincent uh, that have been, the economy has totally been ruined uh, by the cannabis industry uh, when the, the um, growers got patents on the particular strains. It's the same people involved. And um, oh, the altered states. I, I should explain the drunk or stoned thing. Um, <laughs> the first time that I got really uh, uh, effort made to end my employment at a university was when I said that Understanding Psychosis, a book with Peter Kinderman and others, you had to be uh, drunk or stoned to read it because the authors clearly were. 
and they said that, that they threatened the, uh, uh, Kernigan, that that was libelous, and they were going to sue the dean if they didn't stop, he didn't stop me from saying that thing. But there's also another uh, subtle aspect to it. If psychedelic therapy is only a matter of ritual to influence someone in the very suggestible, could it be done when they were simply drunk or stoned? And I was sitting around speculating the other night with some friends while we smoked cannabis, and we came up with the idea that you could get an ideal mixture of alcohol and, and cannabis, and you could, uh, uh, you, could, you could keep it blinded as to which people, which was predominant, and you could treat alcoholism by getting people basically drunk and uh, talking, haranguing it for hours. And that's not very far from what's actually being done. We'll say more about that. And so I learned in our, our, your, your friends uh, in the community there who was upset by that title, I actually think I agree with them more than I agree with the Swedish government. I think these drugs should be decriminalized. I, I think Jung is kind of a bullshit way of going about it uh, as a rationale. But I went through my Jung phase before I started doing LSD. We had a famous Bollingen library at the University of Pittsburgh down the street from Carnegie. And I used to hang out there a lot and try to figure out archetypes. Um, so, but um, back to the talk I gave in Greece, the therapy is poorly manualized. There's little control how the therapy is implemented by different therapists in different patients in different settings. There's no assurance that the patients receive the same psychotherapy were they randomly assigned to the psych psychedelic or to the comparator. And there's good reason to believe uh, that's not the case. And that should set off alarm bells. So the basis of my argument that if you're assigned to as in the um, uh, psilocybin um, for alcohol dependence, that if you're assigned to the group that just got a decongestant, you know within the first 25 to 40 minutes that you got screwed because you're really there not to get treated for alcoholism, but you're there to get high and you're gonna, you're gonna have to put up with hours of people uh, insisting on you listening to music and, uh, uh, and haranguing you. And it's, it's a real drag to find out in 45 minutes, you've come all the way to this treatment setting to get the special treatment and you, you lost the 50-50 bet. You got the controlled condition. And um, so let's see. Oh. Uh, so by therapies formulated to enhance the treatment of psychedelic drugs, it's all about conjuring up a psychedelic state, an ecstatic mystical state. And um, what are you going to do when, you, when you're, you're not assigned to that state? There are lots of descriptions, graphic descriptions of patients in the New York Times and elsewhere. They actually allow patients to become celebrities. You never see a patient assigned to control group. And there's a reason for that. It's pretty boring. The only way they keep patients in these trials is to promise that they'll get the psychedelic uh, drug afterwards, whether or not they need it. So you could be cured of your alcoholism while you're in this um, uh, problem drinking, while you're in this trial, because you just stopped, uh, and a lot of people do. And then you get the drug anyway, and that's real fun. Um, Therapy is poorly manualized. Um, let's see. Oh, oh, I keep getting the wrong button here. Okay. The, uh, so the whole idea of what they're told, therapists need to employ different tools to successfully guide their patients through the experience, including transpersonal psychology. It's an alternative uh, discipline that focuses on altered states of consciousness and a therapy concept, concept called the inner healing experience. Intelligence. So what if you're a skeptic like me and don't think there's any inner uh, hearing intelligence in there? I'll bet it'll still work because you want that experience of getting the drug. And, and so you conjure up the person on the active drug feeling no separation between their ego and, 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 um, and the outside world dissolves. And they sort of transport it to a different dimension of reality, sort of like a waking dream. You know, I, I know that they, they, they criticize the anti-psychiatry people, criticize the pharma a lot for uh, serotonin uh, uh, deficiency. But this is crazier than that. And if you look at the training model, it's really bizarre. 
Uh, and I've had some friends slip into the training and they don't tell you much about psychopharm. They, they talk, you, you take drugs and you can actually get continuing education credit in the United States for going away and taking drugs. Um, and um, uh, it's, it's, it's not really manualized. Um, and right now, there are 5,000 people in the United States wanting to be a therapist, and they're mostly psychologists, and they, and they go away on these weekends and sometimes get free uh, continuing ed credit. But again, it's just kind of a lot of hokey pokey out in the woods. And um, it's interesting that the psychotherapy provided with um, psilocybin is more dangerous than the mushroom itself. And that's and so the IRB has now modified consent forms. There have to be two people present, at least one of them a female, during treatment sessions. Why is that? Well, one uh, therapist in Canada claimed that the patient became so seductive while she was doing psilocybin that he was forced to have sex with her three times. And uh, then she sued him. And, and then there was a Holocaust survivor who uh, was in a trial and she uh, donated uh, her savings to, a, to Compass. And so that was considered undue influence. So the, 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 although this mushroom is supposedly can't be overdosed on, and it's, you can find it in the meadows and you go out there with scissors and cut it off the cow patties, I used to do that. And yet it's so dangerous that you have to have a second person there. Something's going wrong here. And it's very clear that it's not just the therapist that the placebo is, the whole setting creates uh, the, uh, and for the patent for LSD, for instance, it prescribes that, that it be delivered uh, on certain cushions with certain music lists. And that's patented, not the LSD itself. LSD will remain illegal, but the legal medicalized LSD will be, have to be delivered with a, uh, in a certain setting. And it's, that's not the kind of scene that you, uh, there's no white coats there. It, it, uh, these are not typical drug trial settings. And they're often very much like spars. And the idea is that you can go out with the, your partner and do ecstasy on a weekend and save your marriage. And, um, and you, you could have marital, mild marital distress, maybe just go up there on your anniversary. And this will, will drive the um, profit for the psychedelic country companies, not the actual uh, psychiatric use to cure psychiatric problems. So let's, with that in mind, and you probably find a lot of annoying things that I've said, let's jump right to the, um, the article for discussion today, the JAMA paper. Now, when I go to... Uh, one of the things I do, I, I, I screen papers because I, 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 I can't read all the papers that come across my desk. And so one of the first things I do is I go to the uh, altmetrics and see who's reading it. And I feel bad about by altmetrics. In 2010, I was speaking at uh, University of Sydney and uh, at the AABCT conference, I believe. And uh, Evelyn Smith came up to me and she said, I, you know, I thought you were going to really say awful things about mindfulness. And uh, I, I, I think that what you're saying needs to be said. How about uh, I get my husband, Alex, to get you appointed to the PLOS uh, One editorial board, which I was. And one of the attractions was, is we we're going to do away with impact factors and we we're going to go on pub post-publication review. Uh, how much a article was useful and to whom? And so they developed the altmetrics and it soon got co-opted by industry. And so what you find out is that there's many, much more attention to this JAMA paper than papers that you write. And this is only in the, in the first two weeks. It was the top 5% of all research output. But who was reading it? Mainly the public. Very few scientists, very few practitioners, very few even journalists. And most of them were in the United States, a few more in, 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 uh, Sweet, in the um, United Kingdom. I think there were three people in Sweden reading. I don't know who they were. But um, but at any rate, this is disturbing because it gives a sense of who is driving the attention. 
Now, when the first psychedelic papers would, uh, came out in 2006, they bragged that they rivaled the uh, American Super Bowl that was on at the same time. They got half of the traffic to these two articles in, in rather inferior journals as the Super Bowl did. And that, that's real power. And it's, it's gotten more powerful because they've learned better to harness social media. If you start looking up articles to, um, because you're interested in mushrooms, uh, psychedelic mushrooms, then if you subscribe to your local paper, there'll be ads in the paper that are related to that. And that's because the, uh, everybody's hungry for traffic, for advertising, and you begin getting suggestions. When I was doing this for the Greece talk, Greek talk, I got recommendations for therapeutic pillows for dogs to calm them uh, because they, they, they Google had determined that people who are interested in mushrooms were interested in, in uh, therapeutic cushions for the dogs. Actually, my cat has one and they're not that, all that cool. So um, usually I, I look at the uh, conflict of interest I didn't even bother with the JAMA because it was too long. It would have been talked the whole time on it. So I looked instead on the editorial. And you look, and the whole, what, what Healy taught us to say, a whole bunch of pharma whores there. They're, you know, big Buddha, big pharma whores. And I, that's Healy's accusation about me and other people that we are pharma whores. And I didn't actually get much money from pharma. But at any rate, uh, why are these people being the opinion leaders for what we think about psychedelics. And um, it goes beyond a investigator involvement in a trial, you know, the rating in the, the Cochrane. It's, it's a whole corruption. And it's corruption, again, not in terms of just money, but the whole system, that we are being bombarded with information that will convince us that it's a great thing to do psychedelics. Um, and then uh, the other thing I do is I, I look for where authors confess that where they, they know that they're guilty of something. And it's usually in their limitation section. So I went to that in this paper and you can go yourself. And they admit the decongestant was ineffective in maintaining the blind after drug administration. Their hair and um, uh, samples to measure uh, whether uh, metabolites of alcohol were available for only half of the treated participants. So they're entirely dependent on self-report, basically. And the study was grossly underpowered. Um, the study population was actually lower in drinking intensity at screening than in most um, uh, 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 problem drinking studies. And the two group design doesn't allow you to evaluate whether the psychotherapy or the interaction between the psychotherapy and the medication was important. You only got to evaluate the combination. And so we lack information also about what happened beyond the 32 week double blind. So we're prepared for, we ha now have some hypotheses. Let's look at the data. Okay, oh, just a little side thing. I just came up when I was researching this. And uh, it was a, uh, an item in, the, um, in, in uh, my uh, Google News, and that a couple had spent $6,000 uh, to get some mushrooms. Uh, they actually got magic truffles, which are legal in the um, in Netherlands. It's the underground part of the mushroom that the psilocybin goes above. So uh, the truffle is like a tuba uh, underneath the ground. And uh, they spent $6,000. Why do that? You go out and you know, out the cow patties and with, a, with your scissors, you, you think you've got a mushroom growing on a cow ship six hours after rain and you clip it and it turns blue and you know it's, it's psilocybin. Why don't you just go home and do that? But no, you've got to go into the system and $6,000. And what, what could they have done with $6,000 if they weren't doing this? And the New York Times is, is, is a terrible shill. So I, this is one of his suggested readings and if you look, you know, that's the, the, the psilocybin therapy. It's one of the most, uh, it's one of the few times you see anything intelligent. It was a small study they conceded. But let's look at the patient who's presented. She comes from Washington, Seattle, Washington. How the hell did she get in a study 
in Arizona or New York. And she said that the treatment altered her destructive relationship with alcohol. Although she never blacked out, she described herself as a classy drinker. So she wasn't really having her life impaired by drinking. And nonetheless, she now only sips white wine as a result of this treatment. Uh, it's, it's such an atypical experience, um, and it leaves a lot to be explained. But what it is, it's an ad to get more people to sign up. Um, I gave uh, a video, 28 second video to read, uh, to watch beforehand. What's interesting about that is it promotes the idea that the treatment is now available, and encourage you to sign up. And to find out more about it, you've got to uh, give an email. What they're doing is developing lists of people to advertise to for the spars when they do become uh, uh, the, uh, more open because they won't have enough mental health patients. Um, so, and so let's look at the criterion. Four heavy drinking days during 30 days. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, if you're measuring, uh, so if on, in week five, if you measure the outcome, they haven't had 30 days in, uh, with experience with the drug. Nonetheless, oh, here's a little study I did. I was at, uh, uh, we had a, a out of control alcohol uh, grant and they want us to get some data. So we decided we would screen primary care and we would uh, develop a brief intervention for elderly drinkers. And so we screened 8,500 people and we didn't have to have human substance consent because we made the alcohol screening part of intake. And we thought we were gonna be really cool, but we found out that 61% of the patients were abstainers. People in old age, they, if they've been drinking a lot, they've often had consequences. And so they've stopped drinking. In fact, abstainers are actually less healthy than uh, people who are moderate uh, drinkers because um, there's a selection factor. And only 7% of, of the people were actually um, at risk drinkers, which meant they had two drink average, uh, less than two drinks a night. And, and so we really couldn't do a study. We tried doing one anyway, and uh, uh, it, it, uh, we found that the screening instrument was more powerful than the intervention. And it's exactly what was found in this study. If you look right here, on the screen, you see that the drop-off before randomization is larger than the drop-off during treatment. So what you should do is, if you want, if you really believe these results, is you should, you should advertise for people to, to uh, uh, apply to a problem drinking study, and they'll get better before the study starts. And that's because people are exaggerating their drinking in order to get into the study. The second thing is that if you exclude uh, comorbidities, people just don't problem drink. They, they have problems with alcoholism, with uh, substance abuse, uh, and they have trouble with, uh, particularly with insomnia and uh, with mental health problems. If you exclude all those people, you get um, people who are rather unstable in their drinking. So it's conceivable that American being screened in February could uh, be uh, a have 30 days in, in the past uh, uh, 90 days was in, in the entrance. They could have had drinking around the holidays and that would get them in. They could have Thanksgiving, they could have Christmas, and they could have New Year's. A lot of problem drinking stops after New Year's, not because people stop drinking, but they stop the, the binge convince them not to binge for a while because they feel sick and these people would have gotten in the study and they would have gotten would have been regression to the mean and if, if I, you look I, yeah, I, question. I, sorry to break in i have a question from the audience uh, yeah. uh, regarding this drop from um, uh, screening to um, uh, to week i guess week five to eight to me it's a little bit unclear when the uh, the, the therapy started the talk therapy started between week one and four and then the psilocybin was administered that week four was that in in no, this, to me this, it's a little bit uh, uh, hard to understand from from reading the, uh, the of course it's meant the, to be hard the question to understand. is uh, yeah, the question is what could account for for this um, 
uh, the drop that shouldn't have been there, I guess. Well, it, it could have been, to, to if one. you're taking, it's well known that if you uh, recruit from the community rather than from clinics, that you get a lot of uh, so-called normal volunteer study, you'll get a lot of people who are just there for the experience. And the problem with a lot of antidepressant trials is they've shifted from using clinical populations to recruitment from the uh, community. And you get a lot of people that aren't really depressed and they just want the money. And, they, and they're, some of these are professional patients. I, I went out with a woman for a while and she, used, she made a lot, a lot of money managing uh, failing primary care practices and linking them up with drug trials for antidepressants and cardiac medications. And they'd get to keep their patients, they'd get to get the fees and everybody was happy, but the data were, were not valid. So first there was an exaggeration. Second, the criteria of uh, percent heavy drinking days is not, a, it's a very unstable one. It's not like uh, 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 blood glucose levels or um, uh, HB1 and all that sort of thing. And, um, and so all these screening studies, you get people going down either because they exaggerated or because you caught them at a time of heavier drinking, which there's a natural drop. And this is very common in, in uh, drinking study with volunteers. The alternative would be to go in a VA and get some really hardcore drunks that were mu a multi-problem. They don't want to do that. And so it's, um, so if you then, so again, I'm simply planting doubt. I'm not proving anything, but let's look at the, um, the other thing is, why would you want a dichotomous drinking outcome anyway? Because you lose so much information. So let's look at the actual results. And um, statistically, the p-values are, are not uh, particularly impressive. The um, confidence intervals are large. And um, that's because um, there's not a whole lot going on um, associated with the treatment. Now, I was in the, um, uh, the <coughs> prospect study um, that was treating um, suicidality with antidepressants and psychotherapy. And Tom Tenhaves, he was a, my buddy at the time. And uh, unfortunately, he, he, um, he, he died. But before he died, he talked to me about all the pressure on him. Um, Pens uh, University of Pennsylvania, University of Pittsburgh, and Cornell were involved in the study. And the screening scores and the use of psychotherapy varied more by site than it did by condition within the study. And so they only got results by hiding that it was a nested study. If they had done that, and if they hadn't changed the outcome measure, it would have been a bust. And the, the uh, drug company, uh, Forest Labs, really wanted a positive result to show that uh, their drug was effective with the elderly. And so they, they, they worked together to make it appear a positive study. Does that make sense? Anybody? People are saying well, yes in the chat. It so, makes... so you look at the absence, you know, this is supposed to be a, you know, two treatment. If you look at the ads in the New York Times and other places, two treatments will change your life forever. Well, only to the 0.06 level. And I'm always as skeptical as you should be when people start reporting 0.049 in their, um, in their that suggests p-hacking is going on, as we all know. And look, at you, and you see for the actual final week, it's a, a, a 0.03, again, not impressive. And, uh, and for the other criterion, uh, 0.03. So something's rotting. So uh, how could you improve this? What would be the best primary outcome is the question. Um, well, first, I, I, would, I would get real uh, drinkers. And I would also insist on monitoring. So their idea of the treatment target is this, uh, this inner consciousness that you're supposed to achieve. I would suggest the treatment target should be changes in the hair samples for uh, uh, alcohol metabolites, because we know that uh, placebo can influence uh, subjective self-report. It doesn't work too well against objective measures. So do a decent study with objective measures, 
and you've got to do something about the blinding. And again, I, I, in all seriousness, I think uh, a clever person could work up a combination of cannabis and alcohol that could totally blind people as to which one they had, and that would be a more adequate study. Now, there is one suppressed study where they used um, uh, cannabis to stop problem smoking in vets. And uh, what they, it was, a, it was, they were able to blind it uh, with, the, with the dosage of the cannabis. And they, it was a beautifully done study and it was a null study. So it's now been buried. You can go find announcements about the uh, preliminary results, but you'll have a hard time finding the actual paper in which the results were reported. It was a decently blinded a study of cannabis and such a dumb idea. You get a bunch of hardcore drunk um, uh, vets around and you convince them to uh, uh, do some, smoke some dope and they'll stop uh, smoking cigarettes. You know, that's, that's, that's nonsense. Um, and so you look in the protocol and this is strange. They set a dosage of psilocybin for the first session. And if the therapist is not convinced that they're cosmic enough, they up the doses the next time. And again, it's based on a subjective target, not an objective one. And that's a pretty dodgy protocol. And you have to remember, this data is supposed to be going to the FDA for approval. It's supposed to be strictly regulated. And this is not. Usually, I find something interesting in consort. This one wasn't terribly interesting. But we do find that there's an awful lot screened and few actually accepted. So people would call in and then they would get excluded. I think it was likely because they were currently using uh, the drugs or they had recently used the drugs. And, uh, and so they weren't really interested in stopping drinking. They were get interested in getting the drugs. If you make the drugs scarce and you convince people it's the experience of their life, they're going to really want it. And they'll tell you whatever they need to get into the study if it's depending on self-report. And um, let's see. Uh, and it's a very intense treatment. They'd say just two, uh, take psilocybin twice. Well, actually, you've got 12 psychotherapy sessions with two therapists, a licensed psychiatrist, before the, uh, four of these sessions are before the first medication, four between the first and the second, and four in the month following the second. And they say the psychotherapy is described in detail in a separate publication. That's rubbish. You can go chase it down, and it's not really described. There are treatment um, manuals available that actually prescribe the music that should be listened to during the psilocybin and the cushions, but it, it's nothing like, say, when I designed problem solving treatment for adherence to HIV, um, where we strictly told how you would interact with uh, the patient and when they present various challenges, how you deal with the challenges, nothing that uh, all that. And your group perhaps can have a little to say about what your manuals are like uh, and how you deal with problematic situations. And the control group after blinding. So 45, uh, let's say 45 minutes max, uh, people know what group they're in, and they're stuck there for uh, six to eight hours, and they're only allowed to get up to go to the bathroom. The rest of the time, they're wearing a blindfold and listening to music. And again, my, uh, talking to some of the people who were not stoned from the INHN, they said they were blind, they were blindfolded. What else do you want? And it, it's, the sarcasm is, is, is meant to be serious. People know what's happening, and if you're, they're in a control group, it's really ridiculous to have to sit there on, um, on a decongestant tablet for um, uh, all that time and not be allowed to get up except for go to the bathroom and someone telling you to focus on your inner experience. So um, that's my critique. I'd like to hear what uh, you have to say. I'm, I'm open to learning from you. And I, um, uh, I hope that you at least were provoked to think about your assumptions. Thank you so much. We are all muted, but we are all uh, applauding you. Uh, and now I'm opening the floor to um, to questions. If there are any questions, otherwise I will have a question. Perhaps 
Can I uh, ask a question? Mike. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Professor Coyne. Um, I'm curious as to know um, how your criticism has been received uh, by the secular therapist community. Uh, Responses um, you got, because I, I do uh, believe that certain points of your criticism are actually quite well known among the psychedelic therapy uh, or researcher community. And these are problems that they, a lot of them at least, take seriously and you know try to um, solve. Sure. So what happened when I, I published them in an obscure blog uh, on Medium and um, the communications director from Compass demanded that not only that they, the articles be taken down, but she get pre-review of any articles that I would do in the future to make sure that I didn't insult patients by calling them uh, uh, Marvel comic action figures. And because that was so uh, hurtful to these people who so heroically were submitting to treatment and telling the world about it. And they also said that I got some initials confused and that Bessel van der Kolk had less influence on the trial than he did. And she was factually correct about the article, but not as uh, factually correct about his training of therapists. Bessel van der Kolk is making a fortune right now uh, doing workshops. And he is very vague as to how much psychedelic experience he's really had. But he's kind of a, a shady guy anyway. Uh, he's doing talking a lot about his memories of the Holocaust lately because it's really in. And he was born in 1943. And, uh, and so he, he must have acquired those uh, memories quite early. Um, but um, if you go to the authors of these papers, they have many authors on these papers and most of them have no evidence that they could uh, present on a drug trial, uh, certainly to uh, FDA committee or psychiatric uh, sober and, uh, uh, and um, psychiatric audience, but they, they get videos here talking about how it's done at their clinic. And so getting authorship on say a nature medicine or a JAMA paper is a way of advertising your clinic and developing a patient pool for when it, it becomes available. Um, and uh, so, uh, and also when I've criticized, uh, uh, when uh, Robin gets on and, and gives these long uh, tweets uh, talking about how wonderful, uh, if, I, uh, if I interrupt him, then he, he, he blocked me and then the trolls attacked and suggested that in a blog paper, that I had uh, actually it was a fig leaf for uh, recommending adult sexual abuse of children. It has nothing to do with what I was saying about the psilocybin, but it, it was sort of you know throwing a dead cat on the table, so I have to uh, defend myself against that. In short, there's, there's some pretty dirty shit goes on, and why why do they have to do this? They're so powerful. I'm not going to overthrow their empire. I'm just getting an uh, alternative voice going, and they're intolerant of that. I can't get speaking engagements. Um, I was lucky to get this one. Uh, uh, um, I'm interrupting you. Sorry. I, uh, first, uh, a comment from Mike, and then uh, immediately after Puya. We'll, yeah. uh, uh, so thanks for asking the, the question. And uh, There's a few things I noticed. I, I think perhaps there is a valid criticism towards you uh, considering the language you may be using sometimes when you're talking about these things. Uh, and also I'm noticing, you know, a sort of uh, generalization as to a community of they. Okay, I, I also was talking about the psychedelic research community and I know there's not really such a thing in a way. I mean, people are going in different ways. Compass um, is actually seen to have, be in conflict with um, other parts of the psychedelic research community, you know, and these uh psychedelic pharma arguments may be valid in some way you know but here's the thing this this movement is uh heterogeneous and i think it's a good idea to try to uh, compartmentalize or you know divide up the criticism so as not to just attack one big monster because that will not be helpful uh, to you, I think, or to anyone well, who actually I, I wants to criticize to persuade them. certain aspects. Yeah. Um, but, but right now, in fact, there is a conflict of, uh, developing within the community. The various 
uh, startup companies are suing each other uh, over the legitimacy of their patents. And, um, and so, um, so uh, they've got these, these really uh, uh, bulldog lawyers jumping in who've, uh, who specialize in destroying uh, cl uh, patent claims and opening things up. And so some of the companies are, are going after how LSD is described, some of them going after psilocybin. And I, I'm not anti-psychedelic, I'm anti-medicalization. And the, the constant message is that despite what David Nutt used to tell us, that, psych that psychedelics are so dangerous, they have to be stored by uh, in special places locked up and only given out by psychiatrists. When I first came in contact, here was my fantasy of, about psychedelics. I remember seeing a, a couple for in couples therapy and, and the, the guy had maybe four or five days to live and they're arguing. And I thought, geez, if they could just get high together and I wouldn't even have to waste time listening to the same old argument going on. And I could imagine that if um, I could get a safe psilocybin, I uh, guy trips before, it wouldn't be profound change, but it only had to last four or five days till the guy was dead. And, uh, and maybe they'd want a rabbi to do it, or maybe they didn't like to be talked at in mystical language. They just wanted to, to spend some time close together and talk shit, you know? And that wouldn't be possible. Um, and, and so in my ideal world, you'd get assured dosage and um, you'd have some basic training of either a friend or a rabbi or a priest or anybody else, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and then uh, you'd be able to do it, and, uh, and that would be it. Uh, but that's not what's happening. That would be a, a end of life, not what they're talking about. I, uh, do you have a, a quick comment, Mike, before you need to leave? Uh, no, thanks. I just no. want other people to ask their questions. Uh, then it's uh, Puya and then Ted. OK, thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm more like hands-on question, right? wondering uh, how would you design a, a better study since uh, your main comments are about the design of the study, which is very valid, and I find them very interesting. Uh, that was me asking the, the, the question about the best primary endpoint. Uh, would it be possible to do hair sample for inclusion? Is that a cutoff for heavy drinkers? I wonder. Uh, that would definitely be one, but also their claim, there's very strong claim is this is a replacement for all other treatments, including the treatments that you do and the treatments that psychiatrists do. And um, so I would say, get a more representative sample. Go get a bunch of uh, multi-substance using drunks from the VA. Um, they spend a lot of uh, time trying to get VA patients involved. VA patients are, are typically scared of drugs and they don't want more drugs in their life if they're not already using them. And um, they've failed in getting ketamine going in a lot of VAs and have wasted a lot of time and a lot of money uh, because the patients could have been gotten treatment they really wanted if they wanted treatment at all. Um, and, and I think this ad campaigns have to stop and, the, the New and describing New York Times uh, heroic patients has to stop. It has to be done more like a decent uh, pharmaceutical trial. And do you seriously think an ethical board would approve a, a combination of, of, of cannabis and alcohol for uh, as an as a active comparator? Well, it is, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit skeptic. But. Well, only in a context in which the drug was already legalized. And so they're keeping that from happening. They're preventing legalization. They're medicalizing. It's what I call prohibition light. Thank you. Teddy? So what happens if you go out in a cow pasture with your scissors in, in Sweden and, and find some cow shit and you cut above the cow shit with your, will you get arrested? No. I well, you get you probably get a small fine. Why aren't more people doing that? Perhaps they don't know that. Uh, not, not informed, and also um, in Sweden, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, idea is that it's not so much just the uh, uh, 
um, molecule that's needed, but more of a, um, a package. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, Teddy? Yes, please. Uh, great listening to you, James. I've been following you for a while. Uh, I would like to go back to one of your earlier criticisms. Uh, this may be a bit of an ad hominem, but I'd still love if you could elaborate on this one. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier in one of your criticisms that there was this major paper and the fifth author of that paper was the quite notorious Bessel van der Kolk. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I would just love to hear you elaborate a bit on that because I, I me myself, I reacted quite strongly when I heard that because I've been looking into Bessel for some time. Uh, he, he, is he like trying to make a comeback with this psychedelic renaissance or something? Well, what happened to him is that um, I have a former student, uh, uh, Robert uh, Christopher Barden, and he only was with me for a year at Berkeley because Berkeley was a very strange place, and I encouraged him to leave the program that we both arrived at the same time. And he developed, he, he got a law degree, and he, he specialized in going after recovered memory. And so there was a $17 million suit uh, against a woman who uh, claimed that her life was ruined by her therapist while she was inpatient implanting a memory. And, and so when, they, when the testimony cross-examination came, uh, Chris is kind of a, he's, a, he's pretty brilliant doing this, tearing stuff up. And, and so he started talking of, about the, the Holocaust and, and, and got uh, Bessel van der Kolk defending himself that he was Dutch, not German stuff like that. And then he started, then he jumped in and said, on this one paper, uh, you said you had these many subjects, but in follow-up, you had these many. And he said, oh, these, those are the ones that recanted. And so he admitted that he was hiding data. And he ended up, uh, a research assistant took the fall and actually faked federal charges and was banned from getting grants uh, in the near future because she uh, said that she had done it, not, not Bessel. And then Bessel lost his center at Harvard because of his abusive relationship with staff. Um, and there's a lot more about Bessel will be coming out in the, in the next couple months. Uh, I've been talking to some uh, investigative journalists and they were just doing fact checks with me. Um, but if you look at other things he's claimed, all the miracle patients, these are some of the same patients that he keeps redescribing. Well, yes, and I, I some while ago I did some really heavy digging into the whole repressed memories and all that, and and I've been quite concerned about Bessel and seeing him reemerge made me worried. Well, but so what he does is you can go on if you if you if you're adept at this. I get this. Uh, Jocko is uh, Jobo is the name I use because uh, they don't know what J Coin is, so I say I'm Jobo. And so I sign up for all these free courses um, and they allow you to see the, the tapes for free. And they're so outrageous, the garbage he talks along with uh, Porges, the, um, the, uh, the Vagel, uh, Vagel theory guy. And they, um, or Dick Schwartz. And they, it's just rubbish biology, it's rubbish psychology. If they denigrate traditional treatments, yet they make a fortune. The typical person coming to the workshop is not a um, is not a th uh, licensed therapist. It's a patient wanting to join the community, and they're they're making so much money off this. We have already used our one hour, uh, but we have uh, room for one more question from you, Joaquin. Go ahead. Thank you. Well, I just have some minor comments. I went through the history of changes in the clinical trials. And I noticed, as I wrote earlier, that the exclusion criteria have changed. So they, in the in the later part of the study, they include patients who have done psychedelics, but not the last year. Uh, yeah. So they have more. Why they have done these changes? It's impossible to know. I also note that they have actually included 135 patients, not 96. And the time between the 96th patient and the 135th patient is just, it's, I mean, it's 
one month and 23 days. So it's really strange that those 35 are not included in the, um, in the article. Maybe they've uh, done something else like uh, imaging or something. Uh, and they have also added a third session, uh, which lies at week 38. Uh, so I think there's a lot of, you know, uh, you know, design features that makes me kind of uh, wonder uh, how you, you know, know, if I could get more people saying what you're saying, who weren't saying it when I started my lecture, I'd be very excited. Hmm. I, I would go, I would go, you know, toke up myself, you know. Uh, um, see, yeah. I, I have right here. I could, you know, all I, I need to. I want a micro dose. I to go three times because two sets it off, and then the third releases it. And um, I can do that because I claim my eyes are weakening. But the truth is that if my eyes were weakening and I needed to use cannabis, I would have to stay stoned all day to reduce the ocular pressure, and that would be a real drag. So I just say my eyes are weakening. They say okay. You can get this one, and these are the ones that are formulated for sleep, and these are the ones that are formulated for alert. And I think that, and, the, and these are very carefully USP purity. And I think that everybody should be able to do that, but not to be, have to go through all this nonsense of claiming to have a medical condition. Hmm. See, I, I believe that we've, I, I don't, I'm afraid of drugs. I'm afraid of drugs' influence on society, but I have worse fears about uh, keeping them illegal. And particularly when we have more black people, uh, more black males have been in jail than have graduated from college. Can you imagine being a uh, really conservative black woman graduate student and not wanting to marry anybody with a criminal record? It's hard to find them. You could marry a white guy. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Oh, don't so, so we're ending on a, a, a provocative note, I guess. Uh, but uh, it's been a really interesting uh, uh, presentation, uh, very good questions. There are a lot of things to discuss, and I, I guess uh, this will definitely uh, be uh, not be the and, last word. And I, I really hope that you can, uh, can make this tape available. The idea is to get a, uh, a backlog of such tapes that anybody can look at them. And I'm going to, uh, with permission, I'll place some of them on the INH website in perpetuity. People can see them forever and come to their own opinions. Um, and I'll be back in Europe uh, probably uh, uh, after Thanksgiving, maybe December 1st or so. And I won't be going around doing a lot of presentations, but I'm getting an, a, a structure set up in which I can be in one place and do a Zoom elsewhere or even visit someplace cheaply. And thank All you right. very much for contributing that effort. Thank you, uh, everyone, for attending. And now I will end the Zoom meeting. Uh, we're all grateful for, for you uh, taking you. the time to talk to us. And, and if, if you, any private feedback you want to give me that you, you don't want to embarrass yourself or me, um, that's OK. I'll hear it. Thank you. <laughs> I'll send you an email. OK. And all everyone right. else is, is also uh, welcome, of course, to, to of your course. page and, and yeah. uh, send emails. Right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.